Okay, good evening. I want to welcome you to the fourth in our second year series for the Church in the 21st initi Century Initiative initi uh, initiated by President Leahy. And uh, it's a great honor tonight to have our first bishop speak to us. Uh, when I was thinking about the criteria for inviting people, uh, when it comes to people who are ordained, I think to myself, well, let's, let's have priests of Yahweh and not priests of Baal. <laughs> well, tonight we're lucky enough to have a bishop of Yahweh. But another thing that I thought of with regard to this uh, speaker tonight is uh, that about 40 years ago, there was a wonderful essay translated around the world by Carl Rahner on free speech in the church. And one of the best things written about free speech, parasia, uh, happens to be by the notorious Michel Foucault uh, at this time. And uh, together with my daughter, we were um, preparing for one of her classes over at MIT in the art school. and and. Uh, and Michel Foucault reminded us that what Parisia involves is speaking the truth in the sense of what corresponds to reality, uh, speaking it frankly, and speaking it in spite of the fact that what you may have to say is critical, and therefore what you, what you may have to say is, involves risk. And finally, doing all these things because you consider it your duty to do so. And in these later years when Archbishop Quinn has been talking about reform in the church and reform of the uh, higher institutions of the church, um, I think it's fair to say that we not only have a bishop of Yahweh, but we have a free speaker. Thank you, Fred. Thank you very much. Fred invited me some time ago, and um, as our conversations unfolded, he told me that his wife was from Oklahoma. Well, I was bishop in Oklahoma for five years. In fact, I am the first archbishop of Oklahoma. But that is not my only distinction. I am also the first bishop ever to leave Oklahoma alive. <laughs> Before I begin saying what I had prepared to say this evening, I want to tell you that when I was a student in Rome, we had a, a teacher in the American college who was a Boston priest, Monsignor Robert Sennett. And I got thinking of him as I came here to Boston. And uh, he said something which has great relevance to this evening. Now, nearly 50 years ago, when he was teaching us how to give sermons, he wound up a class one day by saying, look, when people ask you to give a talk, always accept, because remember, if they ask you, it's their fault. <laughs> so I hope you won't feel that way tonight, but I want to tell you that at 11 o'clock on the morning of December 6th, 1999, I had a private audience with Pope John Paul II. I had asked to see him for two reasons. First, I wanted to thank him for his encyclical letter, Ut Unum Sint, that they may be one, the encyclical letter on Christian unity. And second, I wanted to present him with a copy of my book, The Reform of the Papacy, which I had written as a response to the Pope's call to bishops and theologians 
to help him find a way of exercising the primacy that would be more conducive to Christian unity. The encyclical on Christian unity is without question unprecedented and revolutionary. I know of no other instance in history where a pope has called for a discussion by bishops and theologians about the exercise of the primacy and said that he could not do this by himself and asked for their advice on how it could be changed. So I believe it is important for us to take a look at three major points which the Pope makes and which have tremendous implications for the future of the papacy and for Christian unity, especially with the Eastern Orthodox churches. In the first place, the Pope clearly affirms in this encyclical, reaffirms the collegiality of the episcopate and he locates the primacy of the Pope within the episcopate. This, of course, is a statement that the papacy is not a sovereign monarchical office. Sovereignty means that authority is absolute and indivisible. But the Pope explicitly states the Pope is a member of the College of Bishops, and the, bish and the bishops are his brothers in the ministry. He further states that the primacy must always be exercised in communion. In other words, the primacy is not outside and above the episcopate. It is within the episcopate. In fact, the Pope is a bishop. And so true is this that the Code of Canon Law and the rules governing the election of the Pope in the conclave state that if a priest is elected Pope, he does not acquire the powers of the papacy until he is ordained a bishop. The last pope who was not a bishop when he was elected was Pope Gregory the 16th in 1831. A second very important focus of John Paul is the first millennium. In the encyclical he points to the first millennium as a guide for recovering visible communion with the Eastern churches. Why is the first millennium important? Precisely because there was an undivided church in the first millennium. And the first millennium knew nothing of the centralization of church government as we know it today. And so we ask the question, what then did the primacy of the Pope look like in the first millennium? Jesuit historian John O'Malley writes, in the first millennium, popes did not run the church, nor did they claim to run the church. They defined no doctrines. They wrote no encyclicals. They did not convoke ecumenical councils. And they did not preside at the councils. So during this first millennium, papal intervention in the wider church was largely confined to two things, what were called cause maiores. That is, the popes acted in response to appeals in notable, unusual cases 
where there were unresolvable differences, such as the case of the vigorously contested dethronement or unseating of St. Athanasius. The popes also made interventions when issues of heretical doctrines could not be resolved at the local levels of authority. During this millennium, the popes did not normally intervene in local or regional affairs, nor did they reserve local issues to their decision. Confirming this statement are the words of Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. The early church, he said, did indeed know nothing of the Roman primacy in practice in the way in which the Roman Catholic theology of the second millennium has come to know it. So my point is that John Paul II focuses on this situation of the first millennium as a guide to how unity might look in the future. In other words, he is saying that in the future, there could be true communion with less, with less centralization and less intervention by Rome. But two questions arise. Did the Bishop of Rome have any distinctive place in the first millennium? And given the fact that there was no Roman centralization in the first millennium, does that mean that Roman centralization is not needed in the third millennium? I will set aside that second question for the moment and take up the issue of what place the Bishop of Rome held in the first millennium. The German historian of the primacy, Klaus Schatz, points out that in the first millennium, even though the Pope was not involved in the ordinary life of the other churches, still there was a development going on, whereby Rome was increasingly regarded as the center of communion for all the other churches. There was a growing, developing conviction that crises of faith could not be resolved apart from the judgment of Rome, and that ecumenical councils could not be considered definitive without the concurrence of Rome. But very interesting, Pope John Paul does not just mention the first millennium in some vague, general way. He explicitly focuses on the structures of unity which existed in the first millennium. And remember, he is talking about all of this as a guide as to what might happen today. What were those structures of unity in the first millennium? Well, they were regional synods. They were the patriarchates, the councils. In other words, the structures of unity in the first millennium were all collegial structures involving the participation of the bishops. And all these structures functioned with a degree of autonomy. Now I say autonomy, not independence. They functioned with autonomy in the sense that their actions were not routinely referred to Rome. This autonomy existed, however, within the framework of communion, communion among the bishops and the churches of the region, but communion with all the other churches and with the church and the Bishop of Rome. 
Yet, communion did not mean centralization. A third point of emphasis in the encyclical is the insistence by the Pope that the primacy cannot be the primacy of a figurehead. The Pope must have true authority to carry out his ministry of unity and communion. This is an important point because sometimes there is the suggestion that unity could be restored by giving the Pope a sort of ceremonial precedence or what is called a primacy of honor. Well, scholars have studied that ancient expression which was applied to the Bishop of Rome by the Eastern Councils as early as the fourth century. And according to this research, the expression primacy of honor was understood in antiquity as a role of leadership with true authority. So that when the Pope holds up the first millennium, he is not implying a denatured papacy with no real authority. In the encyclical then, John Paul II shows a papal primacy embedded in and functioning within the College of Bishops and pointing to less centralization. Now, of course, when these ideas are expressed, there inevitably arise in certain quarters objections that these ideas of papal authority functioning in a collegial and non-centralized way are contrary to the teaching of Vatican Council I on the primacy of jurisdiction. And against such ideas of collegial functioning of the papacy and less centralization, we also hear it said with great emphasis, the church is not a democracy. So before examining exactly what Vatican Council I taught, I want to make some very important observations. The first in regard to the problem of orthodoxy and fundamentalism as they are found in the Catholic Church. In 1993, the Pontifical Biblical Commission published a splendid document on the interpretation of the Bible. It treats the issue of fundamentalism at great length. And I will only quote the concluding words. Without saying as much in so many words, fundamentalism actually invites people to a kind of intellectual suicide. It injects into life a false certitude for it unwittingly confuses the divine substance of the biblical message with what are, in fact, its human limitations. But you will say, that is the Bible. You are talking about church doctrines and church structures. Well, the Vatican Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith at some length dealt with doctrinal fundamentalism in a document called Mysterium Ecclesiae, the mystery of the church. It pointed out in that document that there can be a fundamentalist approach to church teaching, to doctrinal and dogmatic formulations. It went on to say that church teachings, doctrinal formulations, cannot be correctly understood unless 
the use of language, the historical circumstances, and the intention of those who formulated the teaching at the time are taken into account. Most importantly, a correct understanding of church teaching must take into account the fact and the truth of the development of doctrine. So these documents of Rome are a warning against confusing authentic orthodoxy with fundamentalism, even in regard to the papacy. And one of the sources of division, of virulent division, within the Catholic Church today is the failure to understand the difference between authentic orthodoxy and fundamentalism. For some Catholics, Vatican Council I makes it impossible to think of a truly collegial exercise of the primacy. And for most Eastern Orthodox Christians, the Vatican I teaching on the primacy of jurisdiction is an utterly insurmountable obstacle to restored communion. <clears throat> now just to give you an idea of how plausible it is for people to regard Vatican I as an impossible obstacle to collegiality, I just want to read you a portion of the teaching of the council. These are the words of that council. If anyone says that the Roman pontiff has merely an office of supervision and guidance and not the supreme and full power of jurisdiction over the whole church, or that this power of his is not ordinary and immediate, both over all and each of the churches, and over all and each of the pastors and faithful, let him be anathema. <clears throat> well, <laughs> what can you say to that? Well, don't forget, I was just mentioning how Rome was warning against a fundamentalist approach to doctrinal teaching. So keeping in mind this need to avoid the fundamentalist approach to such a text, I would like to begin by taking a look at the language used in the text. It says that the Pope's jurisdiction is ordinary and immediate. That would, on the face of it, appear to end the discussion. But if we are not fundamentalist, then we have to go to the acts of the council. The acts are the records, the minutes of what took place in the council. If we are not to be fundamentalist, we have to go to the acts of the council and see what the council meant by using those words, ordinary and immediate. Well, the acts of the council show that a fair number of bishops got up on the floor and objected to calling the Pope's jurisdiction ordinary, and they objected because they said that would mean that the Pope could intervene on a routine basis in the affairs of all the dioceses of the world. But the commission responsible for the writing of the document listened to all these objections and then on the floor of the council and recorded in the acts of the council replied in this way. They said, the word ordinary is not meant to be understood in its everyday meaning. 
It is meant to be understood in the way it is used in canon law. It is a canonical word, and it's meant to be used as it is used in canon law. And what the word ordinary means in canon law is that it describes a power that goes with and is attached to an office and is not delegated by someone else. It does not mean that that power is used often or on a daily basis. So, having studied the acts of the council, it is clear that the Pope has ordinary jurisdiction, but it does not mean that he must exercise a centralized government in all parts of the church. It means that he has the power to intervene if and when circumstances call for it. That's what we saw in the first millennium. The Pope intervened when circumstances called for it. So the language of the council. A second factor showing that the Vatican Council I did not exclude the collegial exercise of the primacy are these explicit words of the text itself. It says, this power of the Supreme Pontiff by no means detracts from that ordinary and immediate power of Episcopal jurisdiction by which bishops tend and govern individually the particular flocks which have been assigned to them. This means that the power of jurisdiction of the Pope does not dilute or eliminate the power of jurisdiction of the bishops, nor does it exclude the collegiality of the bishops. Now a very striking clarification of all this came when the German Chancellor Bismarck wrote an instruction to all the German diplomats after Vatican I that the Pope had taken over all the powers of the bishops. When this became known and became public several years afterward, the German bishops immediately issued a vigorous public statement denying Bismarck's claim and the German bishops declared, we can decisively refute the statement that the bishops have become, because of Vatican I, mere papal functionaries. According to the teaching of the Catholic Church, the Pope is Bishop of Rome. He is not Bishop of any other city or diocese. The Pope is not Bishop of Cologne or of Breslau. And don't forget, these bishops had been present at the council. But there is more. Pope Pius IX, who convoked and presided at the council on two separate occasions in a very emphatic and public way, endorsed this interpretation of the German bishops, thanked the German bishops for doing it, and congratulated them saying that their statement expressed the true and real meaning of the Vatican Council. So all of this excludes a fundamentalist interpretation of Vatican I teaching on the primacy of the Pope. That teaching of Vatican I cannot be properly or correctly invoked to exclude either the collegiality of the bishops or to exclude a more decentralized government of the church. The expression primacy of jurisdiction, so odious to the Orthodox, does not occur in the encyclical on Christian unity. John Paul II does not use those words in the encyclical on Christian unity. 
But even if it did, it is clear that the teaching of Vatican I does not understand primacy of jurisdiction to mean necessarily a highly centralized or a routine intervention by the Pope in the whole church. Now, Pope Paul VI, as well as John Paul II, have both developed these ideas further. They've drawn out their implications. Both these popes stated that communion with Rome does not mean absorption by Rome. For example, at a mass in St. Peter's Basilica, in the presence of the Patriarch of Constantinople, John Paul II said this, said this, the Second Vatican Council asked that in efforts to reestablish full communion with the Eastern churches, particular consideration should be given to the character of the relations which obtained between those churches and Rome before the separation. In other words, particular attention should be given to the first millennium. These relations, the Pope says, fully respected the power of these churches to govern themselves according to their own disciplines. I want to assure you that the See of Rome wishes to respect fully this tradition of the Eastern Church. Communion does not mean absorption. Side by side with the search for Christian unity, of course, goes the continuing dissatisfaction inside the Catholic Church with the extent of Roman centralization and a corresponding desire for greater subsidiarity and collegiality. Well, the formula of these two popes could very well apply inside the Catholic Church, communion without absorption. Now, these ideas of collegiality present over a hundred years ago at Vatican Council I and more fully developed 40 years ago in Vatican Council II still meet resistance. And one expression of this resistance is the church is not a democracy. The church indeed is not a democracy, but it is a communion. Communion, as most theologians agree, is the underlying idea of the whole Second Vatican Council. And as Father Francis Sullivan has pointed out in an article in America, communion, the essence of communion, is participation. The church is not a democracy, but it is a communion. The church is not a democracy, but it is the body of Christ. And according to the scriptural teaching on the body of Christ, the head may not say to the feet, I do not need you. Every part of the body in that scriptural image contributes in an active and participative way to the whole body. I was present at the historic meeting of Pope John Paul II with the bishops of Latin America at Puebla in Mexico in 1979. One of the strong points the Pope made on that occasion was that the church does not have any need to turn to communist doctrines as a basis or inspiration for her social teaching or social involvement. The basis of the social teaching of the church, the Pope said, is already found in divine revelation, 
in the book of Genesis, where the dignity of man and woman is rooted in the fact of the creation by God. In a similar way, the church does not need recourse to political democracy to ground ideas and structures of collegiality. These ideas are already found in the church doctrine itself of communion, of the collegiality of the episcopate, and in the doctrine that the church is the body of Christ. Now, all along I have spoken about the collegiality of the episcopate because that's the topic. But I am not unmindful that the character of the church as communion obviously has implications for the participation by men and women, lay men and women, in the life and the structures of the church. Now, regarding the collegiality of the bishops, I would like to give two interesting examples which are being more and more talked about as how this could come about today. The first idea that is increasingly talked about and written about is that there should be new patriarchates. What is a patriarchate? Well, the patriarchates were structures that developed gradually and in the very early times. And they were large regions, like on what we would call today a continent or a nation. And at the head of it was a bishop in, who lived in the principal city of that nation or that continent, a principal city of a continent, and was responsible for gathering all the bishops together from time to time and debating and discussing, but also had the authority to approve the appointment of the bishops, to approve the removal of the bishops, to create new dioceses, to deal with all these ordinary things of church life within that framework. So the, the idea today being presented in some sectors is that there should be new patriarchates created. For example, people ask, how is it possible to envision a patriarchate that includes all of Europe, North and South America, the Pacific Islands, Australia, Asia, China, Japan. Well, that's, a, that's in a sense the arrangement we now have. So uh, this idea is being raised. The idea would be that, for example, North and South America would form a patriarchate. Other patriarchates might be Asia, Africa. Now, these are just examples of what might be considered. These patriarchates would have full authority, always working through the local and through the patriarchal synod, over matters of liturgy, discipline of the church, the naming and removal of bishops, the creation and establishment of dioceses, and such things. Now, when such an idea is expressed, it is easy to recognize the near or utter impossibility of Roman congregations, often understaffed, dealing effectively with all church issues of such diverse continents and cultures, of such diverse mentalities and histories, all undergoing rapid and constant change. Now let me give you just one simple example. I gave a retreat at a monastery in Finland, the only monastery that exists in Finland, a year or so ago. 
In Finland, there are 7,000 Catholics and one bishop and seven or eight priests in the whole country. The Bishop of Finland had tried for many years to get the mass book, the sacramentary, approved in the Finnish language. And it was delayed and delayed and delayed. Well, of course, one of the problems was there was nobody in the whole Vatican who knew the Finnish language. <laughs> well, the bishop kept pressing for this. Finally, it came back approved. And he found out that how they approved it was they gave this to a German priest. Why, I don't know, because there is no real affinity between German and Finnish. But I guess they thought it was the best they could do. It's something, there might be something. In any case, it was finally approved, and this came about. So you see how it is dealing with all these manifold different cultures and situations. Naturally, any creation of a patriarchate would have to be understood within the framework of communion. And we must not forget that the mark of communion is communion with Rome. And of course, this need for communion would place certain parameters for the areas of decision making. Now you will say, well, this is uh, a new idea and all. It's not a new idea. This idea is rooted in the ancient structures of the church. It is rooted in the tradition and in the practice of the church. It needs careful discussion. And it does, to some degree at least, provide an alternative to highly centralized Roman government. Are there risks? Of course there are risks. Such an arrangement can carry with it the risk of the development of national and schismatic churches. And that would have to be taken carefully into account in any discussion of the formation of new patriarchates. This risk is one reason why it would probably be better if patriarchates were not identical with one single nation, but rather with, with several nations, as in the case of a continent, North and South America, Asia, and so on. So the, the pr proposal to create new patriarchates is one proposal, imaginative proposal, rooted in tradition, rooted in the practice of the church, for a more effective, expressive collegiality of the episcopate. But there is another imaginative proposal, which was made on the floor of the Second Vatican Council. The Eastern Catholic Patriarch Maximo Sai regarded it as necessary that a permanent synod should be created. Now on the council floor and in the council, there was considerable discussion about the creation of international synods, but these are periodic synods. A synod is a gathering, and in this case, a gathering of bishops, a meeting gathering, coming together of bishops. So the bishops of the Second Vatican Council wanted the creation of periodic synods, and that was done. Pope Paul VI established the International Synod, and they meet every three years. In my opinion, and in the opinion of a very large number of bishops all over the world, 
These synods are not greatly effective in their present way of conduct. So they need to be revised so that they will be effective. But nevertheless, these periodic international synods exist. But in addition to calling for periodic synods, this patriarch proposed that there should be a permanent synod also. Periodic synods, but also and alongside the periodic synod, a permanent synod. The permanent synod would be made up of bishops from various parts of the world. They could be elected by the continental synods through the processes of Episcopal conferences. And they would have a limited term. They wouldn't be for life. They would have a limited term of service for three to five years. Now this synod, this body of bishops from different parts of the world, elected by the bishops with perhaps a certain minority number appointed by the Pope, but the greater number elected by the bishops of the world, this body would always be at the Pope's side to deliberate about the major issues of church life. Obviously, they couldn't get into meticulous little things about, for example, the redecoration of the Cathedral of Milwaukee or the appointment of staff members to the international translation of the English texts. They would have to deal with the great overarching issues of the church. So they would be always at the Pope's side. They would deal with the great major issues of church life. And this body or synod, this permanent synod, would be superior to the Roman Curia. And the Roman Curia would be an administrative, not a governing body. Now in words even more valid today than they were in 1963 when he said them, Patriarch Maximus gave the reason for a permanent synod and said that it was a necessity in the modern world. He said, the Holy Father, no more than any other person in the world, whatever his talents, cannot govern an institution as large as the universal church, just with the assistance of his own staff and bureaucracy. This point is certainly in line with the gospel because if the church has been entrusted in a special way to Peter and his successors, it has also been entrusted to the apostles and their successors. But if the government of the universal church is given to the Pope's staff, the common good will surely suffer and real catastrophes can ensue. And history shows many examples. At the present time, these considerations, theological, structural, and practical, are urgent and very serious. I want to emphasize then that the idea of new patriarchates and of a permanent papal synod are rooted in church history, in church doctrine, and in the practice of the church. They do not derive from modern forms of political democracy. But it is necessary to raise the issue. In a global and rapidly changing world, with instant communication, isn't centralization more necessary now than it ever was? My answer would be, yes, a central coordinating authority is indispensable. There has to be communion 
There has to be a coordinating authority. The ministry of Peter, the ministry of unity. Yes. This is necessary, not only in the present historical context of globalization, but it is necessary at all times and periods of the church's history. This is why it is very important to recognize that in the world episcopate and among the orthodox, there is no lack of appreciation of the value of the papal primacy. For instance, the Ukrainian Orthodox Archbishop Sevalod of Chicago stated in my hearing that the lack of the primacy among the Orthodox churches and their emphasis on collegiality without any papal authority has resulted in administrative chaos with seemingly irreconcilable quarrels to the point that merely attempting to determine who is an Orthodox bishop in good standing and who is not can lead to lengthy and expensive litigation in the secular courts because there is no other arbiter. The absence of papal authority is deeply felt. History shows how the papacy has been the strength of the episcopate and has saved the church. For instance, after the French Revolution, The church in France was in utter disarray. There were serious divisions among the bishops. The only authority who could take hold of the situation was the pope. The bishops couldn't come together. Some were in exile. Some had taken the oath of the state church. The dioceses had been suppressed. Boundaries changed. It was in the religious orders had been sent away. Some of them executed. Priests executed. It was in a complete state of disarray. The episcopate was incapable of dealing with it. The only authority who could take hold of the situation was Pope Pius VII. And he removed more than 30 bishops from their dioceses and redrew the boundaries of the French dioceses and restored the church in France. The bishops of France were incapable of any act of this kind by themselves. Notice this is a striking manifestation of papal primacy even before Vatican Council I, 70 years before Vatican Council I. In 1831, the Spanish and Portuguese governments insisted on the right to name bishops in Latin America, in countries that had been their colonies, while the new revolutionary governments in Latin America claimed that this right belonged to them. As a result of these conflicts, unsuitable candidates were named and some places went without bishops for long periods of time. There was tremendous disorder. The bishops were incapable of dealing with it. Pope Gregory XVI intervened and named directly bishops, restoring the order of the church and the local diocese, even though he incurred the wrath of the revolutionary as well as of the royal governments of Spain and Portugal. In the church-state struggles in Germany in the late 19th century, the bishops over and over again found that the Pope was their great source of resistance to the intrusions of the German government of Bismarck into church life. And I always think of a notable example of the value of the papacy in the 20th century in Pope John XXIII because John the 23rd it was by using papal authority that he called the second vatican council now if you're old enough to remember and you go back to that time of 1960 1958 
If the Pope had sent out a letter consulting all the bishops of the world, should he have a council? They would have said, no. You are the Pope. We don't need a council. If he had consulted all the priests of the world, they say, well, that's none of our business. If he had consulted the lay people of the world, they would have said, we don't know what a council is, and it's not for us to get into those questions. But if there had been no council, at that late hour in the, in the cultural shift, the church would be in a greater state of disarray than it is today. We would have no map, no way of going through the difficulties that we encounter today. So it, uh, the, the, the action of John the 23rd by his own decision calling that council is another evidence of the value of papal primacy in the good of the church and in saving the church in a difficult situation. So none of these proposals about collegiality, patriarchates, a permanent synod, none of this is a question of whether papal primacy is important or necessary. The issue, as John Paul II himself has identified it, is how the primacy of the Pope is exercised. As recently as last month, a news item reported, quote, an Indian cardinal's call for greater power for bishops' conferences and a decentralization of papal authority drew support from Indian church leaders. The cardinal said that greater consultation collegiality and participation of the local churches are needed. Well, this is exactly what the Second Vatican Council said and what the Eastern Orthodox have been saying for decades. The patriarchs of Constantinople have quite openly stated that the Orthodox have no problem with the primacy of the Pope. They accept the primacy of the Pope but they have a big problem with how that primacy is exercised. Thus we are confronted with an immense paradox. It is evident that there is agreement by the Pope, by the world episcopate, by the Orthodox and by other Christians that the doctrine and the historical reality of papal primacy is not an obstacle. All, including the Pope, are in agreement that the main obstacle is the way the primacy is exercised. Well, if everyone is in agreement, why don't things change? And why don't we have visible unity and communion? Well, I think that Rome does not in practice change its centralizing policies, but in fact intensifies them, because there is a great fear of schism. And there is a great fear of the development of national churches a great fear of the disintegration of church unity. Another reason is that there still exists in the Roman Curia and in the wider church a monarchical and sovereign idea of the papacy, which is not the authentic teaching of Vatican Council I. Theologian Michael Buckley, in a lecture given at and published by the Vatican, showed how the teaching of Vatican I has been distorted for more than a century. The search for Christian unity will depend in great part 
on embracing the authentic teaching of Vatican I and its legitimate development in terms of collegiality and structures of participation in Vatican II. But let us face the fact that neither structures nor laws can be effective by themselves. When we believers confront these issues of the church, uh, we must do so in faith. And that kind of faith comes through living communion with the crucified and risen Lord, who alone is the Lord of history and Lord of the church. In that faith, I think it is more important than ever that we should all call to mind the words written by Pope Gregory the Great in the sixth century, when the church was suffering terrible disarray and great conflict because of the collapse of the Roman Empire. There was starvation, social disorder, lack of communication, terrible suffering. And these are the words uttered by Pope Gregory the Great in that context. And they ring down the centuries with an eternal freshness and speak to us today. He said, dawn changes imperceptibly from darkness to light. And so the church is called dawn. While the church is being led toward the light of faith, she opens gradually to the splendor of heavenly brightness in the way that dawn yields to day after darkness. Dawn hints that the night is over, but it is not yet the full light of day. Dawn is both darkness and daylight. And are not all of us who follow the truth in this life, daybreak, 